Hey everybody, you're listening to Raw with Marty Gallagher and J.P. Bryce on ICTV. Today we've got a new addition to the podcast that you'll be hearing from time to time. Coach Jim Steele is former head strength coach at University of Pennsylvania. He's also a competitive powerlifter, bodybuilder, as well as a blogger and book author. And he's now a writing and podcast contributor here at Iron Company. Welcome, Jim. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You got it. All right, today we're going to be discussing athlete, coach, and writer Bill Starr. So, okay, Marty, so you knew Bill, and in fact, you've told me that he was your, your mentor. So, Well, I'll kind of sort of. Now, look, before we uh, jump into that, I want to just jump back on Jim for a minute. Jim was the man at University of Pennsylvania for 10 years. 20. How many, 20. Well, uh, 20 years. Uh, now, uh, how many years under uh, Wagner? Yeah, it was only like three years. And then he, oh. Rob left and went and opened up his own gym. And then I got the head coaching job there. So then I was in charge from, yeah, I was there 20 years. I think I was in charge. 20 years. I, I, how many sports did you ever see? 33? 33. 33 sports. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I've seen you coach. You're a great coach. Yeah. Very effective. Thanks. That. Yeah. That's okay. why I like to coach and write. That's about it. The lift. <laughs> like the lift. Right. Yeah, Jim's also my right-hand guy when we work with uh, Elite Military, which is a completely different archetype, but we'll get into that another time. Right. Uh, Bill Starr was uh, influential in my life. Uh Starr was born in 1938, okay, and I first, he first started writing for Strength and Health magazine in 1966. For for Bob Hoffman, for Bob Hoffman, York Barbell. Yeah, actually, he was part of what they called the the Texas Connection, Uh, Tommy Suggs began working for Strength and Health magazine in 1964. He brought in Terry Todd. Uh, and then in 66, they, they brought in Starr, who had an interesting background. Uh, Starr was in the Air Force, and uh, guess where he was stationed, Jim? Uh, Japan. Uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Oh. <laughs> I know he's in Japan for a while. Okay. Okay. Uh, Star was interesting. He had a a bachelor's in sociology from uh, Southern Methodist University. And he had a master's in social work from Georgia. I didn't know that. And eventually... He was ended up in Chicago as the youth director at YMCA up there and began. That's when his association began with York and Hoffman. And the, all of them migrated to, to York. And uh, I've got from what, uh, Stars. He, he left Strength and Health in 1971. And that was, so uh, what's that, five years? Were you, did you, uh, you were too young, Jim, right, to have been influenced by Star in real time, right? No, I wasn't influenced by him until I started coaching, and then I read the Bible of strength conditioning. Uh, he was really the first one to put out a book that actually... Uh, was that the football book, The Strongest yeah, Shall Survive? I'll Survive. Yeah. And did tons of research on that. You know, when he was, uh, I think he was at the SMU library doing most of that research. Yep. Uh, man, that book is fantastic. He was at the you know, University of Maryland when he started writing that. And I remember he wrote a huge chapter on marijuana, steroids, and everything. Right. And he actually got Coach Claiborne, who was at Maryland at the time, who was in the College Football Hall of Fame, who was best friends of my father, to endorse it. And Coach Claiborne was like Mr. FCA, you know, no drugs, nothing. And uh, Super straight. But I'm thinking that. You know, the book was so great overall that Coach Claiborne probably just sort of skipped that one chapter. But uh, I was shocked that he gave that that endorsement. But it just goes to show you how great Star was as a coach, man. I mean, he was such an innovator. You read that book, you're just like, 
all of this applies today. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine who's the head strength at an SEC school. And uh, I said, what are, you, what are you doing programming? Was He said, oh, man, I'm doing the star big three. <laughs> yeah, so it still applies. You know, squat, incline, punch, polish. Uh, now, now, what did Star do? Let me let, let me see. Uh, he replaced what? Uh, he replaced the power clean for what? Uh, no, he did the power clean. Uh, no, I'm saying no. He he you, uh, he installed the power clean, but did, didn't he drop the debt? What, what did he do? Did he do squat like bench power work. clean? I think that was his big three. Yeah, I got to go back, but I think it was the clean bench and squat were the big yeah okay players. yeah that's what i think too so he dropped the deadlift i think so yeah <clears throat> uh there's a uh hey hey by the way was he credited for the uh five for five did he start no. that no no, no. Uh, yeah yeah he did didn't he yeah bro. i think reg park was probably yeah about it with that. bodybuilding but but star with it with the uh training of the athletes yeah, yeah. So, but but Star was a hell of a hell of an athlete. See, he was a hell of an athlete and a hell of a writer. And Never. so, because of that, he was like a he was like a god to me. Right, yeah. coming up is like that's what I want to be. I want to be a hell of an athlete and a hell of a writer. Yes, right. He cleaned four forty five and stood up with the gym, weighing two eighteen. Crazy. How about the he did one power lift of me. At 198 or 198. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. And never had deadlifted or, you know. Yeah, yeah, keep going. And you know what he did? What did he do? 661 mm. at 198, right? Yeah. And uh, the modern famous coach from Ohio said, well, that was the reason why you can improve in the deadlift without doing the deadlift because Bill Starr improved with the deadlift without doing the deadlift. And my retort to that was, is yeah, but at the time that Starr did the 661 deadlift, he cleaned 445. Yeah. So here's, here's the lesson to be drawn. If you can clean 445, you don't need to do deadlifts. <laughs> we'll give you a pass. How about well, that? You know what? Yeah. I, I think you're going to pull damn near seven. Yeah. Okay. And that's the lesson that I gleaned from that. Yeah. The lesson of truth, right? Plus, look so, at the amount of pulls he's doing every single day. You know. Uh, and he was he had a great leanness to him. You know, he at uh, at 198. Now, uh, Star was a tall guy. Well, you know, relatively. I'm thinking, you met you met him when he was older, Jim. I'm thinking yes, he was like five nine. Yeah, five nine, five ten. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Five ten in his prime, and you know, at 198, yeah. which at five ten, you're skinny, man. If you're at 198 at five ten, and the guy pressed 315, right in competition. Wait, overhead? Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, you know man, he told me that he's the one who told uh, the Russians about the Hannibal. Oh no no no! That would have been way before him. That would have been John. Uh, that would have been back in John Ziegler's day. Yeah, but Ziegler was the one who brought it to York with Star and all those guys, and he's the no, one. No no no! You got okay, your, well, you got your timeline that. all twisted up. Okay, let, he got twisted then. Let let uh, Marty straighten you out on that. Okay, but let's save that for another show. We'll we'll get right, the right, the, right. the Annabelle timeline straightened out let me just say that that the 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 inspiration for ziggler's research yeah. into synthetic testosterone was based on a drunken conversation he had with a russian doctor in vienna in 1956 yeah. and after too many drinks the russian let loose that they were uh, supplementing their uh, their lifters with uh, testosterone. And so Ziegler went back home and looked into oh, it. And that was the story. Ziegler was from Olney, Maryland. Oh, I know. Right up the road from where I grew up, right? Yeah. And all the York guys would go up there and build, I'm talking Bill March, Bob Bednarski, all the, the hardcore old York guys. Remember the Olney Theater? The Olney Theater. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's where it's at. Have you been there? Yeah, I want to see Joseph and the amazing Technicolor. <laughs> well, you were you were you were ten miles from where I grew up. 
Yeah, <laughs> man, I knew Wheaton and all that. I yeah, know. shit, that, 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 You were in Rich County, but Wheaton wasn't rich, but you were in the... Ah, uh, yeah, that was, yeah. Anyway, so uh, back to Star. So uh, in 1971, he'd left Strength and Health, and he he got involved in something called the Weightlifting Journal. Okay. And it was a great idea. It was purity. It was this 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 uh, West Coast publication. There was some weeder money into it. They thought, man, we're going to launch this thing. This is going to be the anti York, anti strength and health. Uh, but the problem was that it never got critical mass. There just weren't enough weightlifters in the United States of America yeah. to make it financially viable. And then you had the crash and burn of American weightlifting. And then in 1972, the press was dropped, right? So all of a sudden, Americans were like, well, you know what? If weightlifting is just snatch and clean and jerk anymore, we're not so much interested. We like this powerlifting thing, this brand new powerlifting thing. Powerlifting wasn't formalized till 1970, right? I mean, well, our national championships were held in 1964, 65. So Starr was on the, the, the forefront of all of that. He was um, he was the leading uh, theoretician. He was the guy who, if he didn't have the theories. He talked to the guys who did have the theories, and he talked to the Eastern Europeans, and he talked to his uh, George, him and George Friend were big buddies, so they talked okay. powerlifting strategies. And the Hector, article, Hector, uh, when Hector came in when? Oh, jo oh, now okay. Oh, uh, so after after the West Coast uh, lifting journal thing folded, then. Star's next move. Now, sometime in this time period, he was the strength coach for the Baltimore Colts. Oh man, I know. All right? about, he told right? me all about that. Yeah. Now, do you do you know anything about that? Yeah, let me tell you this story. I got to tell you this story. It's it's the best ever. So Mike Curtis, who was a killer, actually from Maryland, from Rockville, my from neighborhood, Rockville. went to Rich Rich Montgomery Rockville. High School. That's the high school I went to. <laughs> oh shit. Yes. He, yeah, he didn't get kicked off the team though, right? Oh, not at Richard Montgomery. No, he was a pussy at Richard Montgomery. Oh, he was? <laughs> oh, yeah. He went to what, Duke or something? Anyway, smart guy. So Star... He's a savage. Star says, uh, all right, Mike, you want to come to the gym? So the gym wasn't... They didn't have weight rooms in the NFL then. No. Oh, so they went to a gym probably in Towson or something like that. <laughs> and Mike Curtis walks in and he says, all right, I'm ready to train, but today I want to press. And Star says, okay, what are we going to do? He goes, I'm going to press 300. Mike Curtis says that. And Star says, well, Mike, your best is like 270. And he goes, I'm going to press. Which is pretty which is pretty damn good. Right? And so Star goes, okay. And then Mike looks around and sees Star's girlfriend in the gym. Ooh. And he says, I'm not lifting with a woman in the gym. And Star Ooh. goes, why? She's just standing over there, man. He goes, she has to go behind the curtain. Back then, no women allowed. Was he so a Muslim? he's on the other side of the curb. So then he puts 300 on, and the star is like, there's no way he's going to do this. And he gets crushed. He gets it like halfway up. <laughs> and star goes, okay, man, let's just do some work sets. And he's like, I'm going to press. <laughs> on he said, got it in his freaking head, man. He just went yeah. into another place. Yeah, went that's right. Another zone, and he pressed 300 yeah. pounds yeah. off his head. And Star said he'd never seen anything like it. The power yeah. mind, you know, that was illustrated right there. That, you know, even though you haven't done it, <sighs> your mind right, you get fired up enough, you get that adrenaline, all the catecholamines going, bam, press 300. Jimmy, yeah. they wrote a song about it. They wrote a song about that? Yeah. Psycho Killer Keskase. Yes. I'm you, I'm so, so, so maybe that's, so maybe that's my, maybe that's my problem at the gym. There's too many women around. Well, there you go, well, buddy. Well, I think they did an actual study, and it actually increases your testosterone. So. Uh, yeah, no doubt. We won't talk about my <laughs> training partners who used to watch porn before the workout. <laughs> they so, you know what? You there. Know what and you, and you know these guys, Jim. Carolyn you know them. That's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get back to Bill Starr. So Starr ended up at in Hawaii, okay? 
Yep. And he was a strength coach out and there. You know why? Yeah, I think so. I think you, yeah. But right. I don't know if we want to bring all that up. No, 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 no. So he's at uh, University of Hawaii. He's doing great work. He's turning out, you know, NFL level guys, right? Yeah. The, uh, what's the ethnic Hawaiians out there? They're not Samoan. Are they the Samoans? What are they? The Polynesians? Yeah, anyway, yeah. And, and Star is just turning these guys into monsters. So then he ends up back in Maryland. And this is like in 1979. His star had a brother named Don. Mm -hmm. Don lived in uh, Jim. Where's Bill from? Is he from Bel Air? Harvard Gras, right? Yeah, Harvard Gras. Yeah. Well, his brother Don lived there, so you know Bill would, I guess, stay with Don. And Don was a stable guy, but Don put on powerlifting competitions, so the. Chalet crew would routinely go to Don Starr's meets. Mm. And for a period of about three or four years, Bill was a regular fixture there because he was staying with his brother, right? So uh, that was my introduction to Bill Starr. And the first time that I uh, met was probably 19, I'm thinking like maybe 1980. I was yeah. actually lifting in that competition. I lifted at 198, and Cassidy was my coach. So Hugh knew Bill Starr. They were like old buddies. <coughs> and, Where? Yeah, Cassidy was. And Hugh's weighing like 198 pounds and Cassidy. competing in bodybuilding competitions and stuff. And yeah. so, I'm, you know, we're there, and so uh, they show up, and Bill says, I've got some really incredible – smoke from Hawaii, you know, Maui, Waui, and he said, let's get in. He says, oh, let's go out to the, I don't know, you had like a 67 Opal or something, right? <laughs> 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 I went with him. We got in the back, and and uh, so Hughes in the driver's seat and started up front, and I'm in the back laying across, and I've got a lift, so I've got my mind and shit. And so Star lays his, his left hand across the back seat, and his first off, he's got like long, long gray hair. Okay. And he's got a goatee. His skin is gray. Yeah. Right. And his left hand is extended along the back seat. And his pinky finger has like a three inch sharpened nail on it. Right. I'm like, what yes. And I'm like, I'm looking at him going, this guy looks like a vampire. Yeah. Right, yeah. and but he's in shape. I mean, he's he's looking good back Rip. then. Unless he's, uh, if he was born in '38, he's like mm, 42 years old at the time, and he's like you know uh, 5'10", 210, right? But uh, you know, he looks he looks good, except for this weird vampire vibe thing he's got going, right? So anyway, so he starts. He whips out this thing and. and you know, it's like I had been imagining in my mind all these years. Oh, at some point in my future, I'll get and I'll be with Coach Bill Starr and we'll talk and they'll just think, oh, Marty, you're so smart and we'll be best friends. And, you know, we'll you know, come live with me and we'll become, you'll become an Olympic champion. You know, and, and, and all of a sudden, here I am with the guy. Right. And he's with me, right? And him and Cassie are like talking. They're like, oh, well, you know, uh, what do you think about uh, orange juice? Or, you know, what do you, uh, you know, and I'm growing some, uh, I'm grafting, he's like, I'm grafting pear branches on apple trees. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, and it's like, there's, this weed is incredible. And I have to squat. And, you know, and I want to be, I want to interact, but it's like for the first and only time in my life. Jim, have you ever known me to be tongue tied? Uh, now usually have a little bit to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even yeah, if it's yeah. negative, but uh, at that I, I couldn't speak. I was just like I was just 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 like a you know rain man. Yeah, man. Well, you're around these you're around freaking Bill Starr. Uh, yeah, and yeah. he was kind of like my idealized life model, which ultimately I kind of uh, adhered to. Yeah. The 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 good athlete who is also the good writer. Hey, Marty. Yeah. So how old do you figure you were at this time? 
Well, I think I was probably like 28. Okay. Right. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you young know, guy. young guy coming on the comeback. I'd been off the scene at the time, but, but Star was a powerhouse. Oh, at that meet, at that same meet. Uh, Jim, Jim, do you know who John Gamble is? Of course. He was a strength coach. He was a great power lifter. He used to lose like 50 pounds in two weeks. And he was also a 900 or close to 900 pound deadlifter and then was a strength coach for a long time. Well, I knew him when he first broke onto the scene. Yeah. His his mentor was a guy named Bill Dunn. And Bill uh-huh. Dunn was a strength coach at UVA, University of Virginia. Yeah, I know, I know. And then Dunn had to leave and John took over. But Dunn and the boys from UVA came up to lift at one of Don Starr's meets that Bill was at that we were smoking weed in the car that I had to lift at. Yeah. Okay. And it was the, my first look at John Gamble. This guy was a freak. He He's scared sick. the shit out of me. Thick. And I'm training with Mark Chalet, and this guy scared me. <laughs> he was huge. Yeah. He was he was my height, five ten, maybe five eleven, but his upper body was inc- was unbelievable. Right. Huge and big thighs, big butt. And these long, skinny calves. <laughs> really strange. Yeah. At the meet, this is the first time he attempted to squat 800. Oh, before that, Bill Dunn, his mentor, was there to set a national record in the bench press. Oh, shit. But in order to get to the bench press, he had to do a uh, uh, token squat. Oh, no bench press only back then? No, you had, yeah, no, no bench press only. Come on. I, that's sacrilegious. Yeah. We didn't do that. Yeah. If you wanted to bench, you had, yeah, I mean, you know, you had to go through the squat first. So he took 135, and on his first attempt, he got three red lights because he didn't go deep enough. Oh, boy. On the second attempt, he got two red lights because he didn't go deep enough. On his third attempt, he got two red lights because he didn't go deep enough, and they bombed his ass out with 135, and he threw a fucking fit. I bet. Okay, because now he couldn't try his national record in the bench press because he couldn't get down low enough with 135, and he couldn't. So that was the start of that. Then Gamble came out to try to squat 800, and he was in a bad mood. (laughs) Don Starr limited... Spotters, they had like these two skinny ass spotters on either side, and Gamble went down with 800 on a second attempt, and he lost his balance forward. And he went down in his right knee, then he went down in his left knee. The spotters wow. grabbed the bar, then he pitched forward. When the spotters were taken, driven to the platform along with the 800, Gamble's under the bar his body is twitching i'm looking at this going this is the first fatality in powerlifting <laughs> mm. yeah right yeah so he so turned, he turns his head sideways a, everybody goes crazy a bunch of people run out of the audience they pick the bar up he jumps up and he's like giving the high five sign <laughs> right then he comes back and makes it oh boy oh yeah and that was, just, that was the first time I saw John Gamble. I said, this guy's destined for stardom. And that was when he was a local guy making his, I, I think he was like 19 years old at the time. He ended up oh, unbeatable internationally. He, he just routinely kicked ass in the best in the world. His total <clears throat> record stood for 10 years. Yeah. Kirk couldn't beat it. No one could beat it. Wow. Kirk eventually did beat it. But it it took a while. Uh, Twenty two seventy one. Wow. Um, eight eighty one squat. Uh, Five eighty three bench. Eight forty deadlift. He did that after losing twenty one pounds in twenty four hours to make the two seventy five limit. Wow. You know how he did it, Jim? How? Uh, uh, rubber suit. Uh, 20 minutes in the hot shower, 10 minutes out. Mm. Keep doing it. Yeah. Right. Until you're there. 
And he did that a bunch of times. He was always uh, he, well. He did it until he lost the twenty one pounds. Then he weighed in, but in those days, you weighed in within two hours of the competition. Yeah, and he rehydrated the best he could. And then he set the world total record and squatted 881, bench 583, deadlifted 840, and set a total record that lasted for 10 years. That 840 deadlift is just yeah. awesome. Yeah. In a completely whacked out physiologic state. Yeah. Right. He probably didn't even think about it. He didn't know he was supposed to be weak after losing all that weight. Uh, they said he was going to be a serious contender for the United States Olympic team in 1980, but the Carter boycott uh, ruined his chances, and that's when he turned his full attention to powerlifting. Yeah, that was and great. Then, as, as you know, uh, he was a strength coach in Virginia for 10 years. Then he went to Miami. They loved him. He was the strength coach under, I think, four different coaches. He ended up as the director of player development, mm -hmm. which as you know, is above the strength coach thing. He was a fixture at Miami. Uh, then he went on to Buffalo. I don't, haven't followed him since then. He's, he did the Buffalo not, thing. He was just training the linemen and they loved right, it. Right. Yeah, loved it. Yeah. Right. Well, he, he's a historical guy, both in terms of his athletic prowess and his strength coaching ability. Uh, he and I spent some good time together, uh, but I don't want to get off on John because, you know, it's really about Bill Starr. Uh, so, hey, now, me. Can I tell you how I met Starr? Yeah, now, yeah. Now, you knew him because did, you knew him from afar, too, right? Like me. Oh, of course. I was reading his stuff forever. So I'm at Penn, I don't know, 15 years ago, and the, the head lacrosse coach uh, had played he was Hopkins. Hopkins. Because he was at Hopkins. Yeah, he was at Hopkins for Aber years. Or drive from Aber Aberdeen every morning in an old jalopy. This, <laughs> this car was like spewing fucking smoke. And I mean, he was. <laughs> and he made $12,000 a year. Uh, Jeanette Hopkins. Yeah. So I was sitting there talking, and I go, he goes, uh, I, I was talking about Bill Starr. I said, You know what Bill Starr says? And he goes, You mean Starman? This is the cross show. Starman, yeah. And I was like, You know him? He goes, Dude. He was my lacrosse coach. I mean, he was my strength coach when I played lacrosse at Hopkins. And I said, I, I have to meet him. And he goes, all right, here's how it works. <laughs> has a, but it's only connected to a fax because he was writing for Iron Man. He was writing for Milo. He was right. So he would fax in his articles and he would fax them back and all that stuff. Fax. He said, so I need to fax him. To say a request. I need to come see you, and I'm going to bring such and I'm going to bring Jim Steele. And uh, is that okay? And you weren't allowed to come down before 2 p.m. No, he slept at 2 p.m. because he, he stayed up all night painting and writing. Painting so, what? What was he painting? Oh, he had he painted original paintings. He painted, you know, he painted. He, I have one of his paintings of a uh, General Lee's General Robert E. Lee's headquarters in Gettysburg. I mean, uh, how, 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 how do we? I mean, honestly, yeah. What did you think? Oh, it's it's excellent. In okay, fact, really. Good, fact, good, 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 good. In fact, he traded his paintings for like dental appointments, doctors' appointments, things really? like that. Oh, yes, that's great. yes. But anyway, so so he had a talent. Uh, Volker faxes, you know, Coach Volker faxes star. Two days later. He walks up to me and goes, we got the okay, we're going down. So I'm like, where are we going? He's like, he lives in Aberdeen in the park. So I'm like, Fuck, dude, I'm ready, man. Where, <laughs> so, where is Aberdeen? It's, it's uh, you know where the Ripken complex is, the Little League complex? It's across the street. He lived across the street from on 95 where they're... No, Ripken no, complex. no. Talk talk to people who don't are not oh. from Maryland yeah, yeah. don't oh. know what you're talking about. Um Aberdeen is in, uh, it's it's sort of the beginning uh, of the Chesapeake Bay up there, right? So the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay. It's pretty um, rural. I mean, you're not talking Baltimore or Washington. No, no. And you know what's funny is that, and that's a lot of places in Maryland, you could be 45 minutes from, you know, D.C. or you could be 45 minutes from the heart of Baltimore and be out in the middle of nowhere, yep. you know? And that's that's sort of what, you know, where he grew up in Habitat well, Grace. But in Aberdeen, he lived in an apartment. Now, was that uh, why? Why did he end up there? 
I, I think he had he had he was basically done with. I might as well be honest with you. He didn't want to be around people anymore. He had done his his uh, he'd done all his coaching. He moved all over the country. He, you know, he coached all over the place. He'd done all this stuff, and so now he was sort of just wanted to paint. Did he express that to you? Yes. Yes. Good. And I said, Good. well. I said, well, you know, and it was a private conversation, but he's like, well, I'm like, what about your family? He's like, I'm good right now. You know, it was no. sort of like he didn't really want to talk about it a whole bunch. But I'm like, how can you go without what, seeing your kids? And, you know, what, and he's just like, I took care of his, Well, I mean, if he raised them and they're OK yeah. and they're fine, it's like, bang, you go live your life. Yeah. Uh, what was his routine? So we get down to Aberdeen and we walk in and he's got paintings everywhere. And they're little, good, and they're good, right? Yes, oh, little cool, apartment, cool. and he is so gracious, and yeah, yeah, he's got long hair, he's got a baseball cap on, fingernails that look like you know freaking Dracula, um, and and he's just you know come on in. So we're sitting there talking, and he goes, "Is, uh, it, is it neat and clean?" Uh, uh Mod- it's sort of like an organized messiness. You know, okay. if you know what I mean? Right. So we're sitting there and I'm, we're talking and, and, you know, he and Volker are catching up and all that. And uh, I said, well, coach, I got to use the bathroom. He's like, all right, we'll go down the hallway. So you go in and there's all these like centerfolds from like 1972. <laughs> penthouse and Playboy centerfolds all over the bathroom. You're taking a piss. <laughs> Kitty. At, you know, Miss March oh my God. from 72. No explanation. <laughs> Miss March. Did you ever ask him? Did you ask him about it? No, no, no it's just rude, rude JP. Point of view. That's a great conversational been. piece. It God, could have you're been. So I, you're so rude. Like, you're so rude. This might only take anywhere, JP. That there were certain things. <laughs> I asked him about that you could talk about and certain things that you couldn't. So then Volker says, "Let's go get you a beer, Coach. You know, um, yeah. you know, I'll buy your beer." So we go to Grumpy's, which is the best. <laughs> Grumpy's. It's in the bottom of a Ramada Inn, right yeah. off that exit. If anybody listening, right across from the Ripken uh, Stadium, get off there, go to the Ramada Inn. Grumpy's amazing, you know, Maryland to the core. So I had some cream of crab soup, and then I just started asking him a million questions. You know, like, what was it like training at York? You know, all that stuff. Was he was he uh, sharp? Was he sharp mentally? In his in his responses. Oh yeah, yeah. He was all. Oh, there. that's cool. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, he was all there. And oh, I remember he excellent. he didn't eat the bun. He just he ordered a burger, like a bacon burger. Took the bun away. Ate the vegetables and the meat. Um, you know, he's a big. He was a big low carb. You know, he, you know, because he had he would drink three Millers High Life Miller mm-hmm. High Lifes every night, and he'd smoke his weed, and that was his which car. He grew, in which he grew, right? Any what? Didn't he grow his own bud? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know that that when we talked about how much money he makes, he goes, well, I need this much for weed, this okay. much for Miller, this much for, you know. I, 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 I had heard that when he left his apartment, he, like, unplugged the refrigerator and the television and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So check this out. So we had a TV with a VCR and three tapes. He had Billy <laughs> Nelson, <laughs> Seinfeld, and I think he had Travis Tritt. Yeah, and he okay, had stations, no cable, had that old rabbit rabbit ears antenna. Oh, and yeah. Coach, he goes, yeah, they're getting ready to have mandatory cable around here. And I said, what are you going to do? He goes, I'll just keep watching Willie. You know, he was <laughs> <laughs> at all. So, you know, we started talking and we hit it off. So I would ever, now I didn't need uh, Coach Volker to go. He left and went to Drexel anyway. But so I would fax him once in a while and I'd say, Coach, can I come down and see you? Two days later, Coach Steele. Yes, yes. Oh, Coach Starr, Coach Starr. He's like, come on down, two o'clock, you know, whatever. So I'd show up. And the one time I go, I I went and uh, was sitting there and he goes, I got to go from, I brought my assistant, Brett. He's from Wichita Falls, actually, just a small world. And, uh, he goes, we got to go for, I'm going for my 45 minute walk. So before his hip got really uh-huh. bad, he went for a 45 minute walk every day. He'd go around the apartment complex. He'd stop at Goodwill. He got a lot of his stuff from Goodwill. And then he'd make another loop and he'd come back and all this stuff. So we're sitting there and, and he's just so gracious. And he says, uh, whoops, sorry about that. And he says, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Man, you're he a popular says, uh, individual. 
I said, Coach, because I knew Star loved the high pull, right? I said, oh. Brett doesn't believe in a high pull, Coach. I said, uh, he thinks it, it doesn't bring your hips through and all that stuff. And Star goes, that's a bunch of bullshit. Let's go in the, <laughs> so go in the bedroom. And he's got, you know, 135 pounds. With <laughs> There's shit everywhere. Iron Man, Milo. <laughs> oh, he's giving us stuff. I got a bag full of magazines. So he says, all right, let me see your high pull. So he starts doing a high pull. He's saying, where the shit? Pull that mother. You know, he's just ripping Brett. <coughs> Brett, collegiate weightlifting national champion. He's like, now you got your hips through. You know, he's ripping. So then he says, now let me see you press. So Brett goes, well, coach, you know. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He goes, I don't give a shit. No. So, so this is when I saw stars you know uh competition <laughs> he was in it man and i just stood back and sort of took all this in and brett tries to press it and he doesn't hit the ceiling but, but star goes fuck that man press that fuck. you know he's cussing at him so brett goes coach it's gonna go through the ceiling he goes press that son of a bitch boom right through the ceiling man <laughs> two indentations fiberboard in coming down now you're explosive. Now you're pressing. Yeah, you did it. It was a whole different level of intensity. Whole different level of intensity, you know? That was uh, that, that, that must have been an easy ride home. So then he goes, wait, we're not done yet. So then he goes, <laughs> so then he goes, all right, boys, I'm going to make y'all something to eat. Oh, so good, 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 good. Let's have some soft shell crabs. Uh, and I'm excellent. like, coach, and yeah. you know, from Maryland, <laughs> it's a delicacy. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, 15 bucks a crap. Oh, so mm, Brett has mm, never mm, had that before. So he's frying these soft shell. Now, Coach doesn't have much money. And he's frying this up. This is a big deal for him to make. So I eat mine in about two seconds, you know. But Brett doesn't know. Uh, how, how, how were they? Oh, they were amazing. Oh, and he just good, lightly good, good. And lightly browned. Oh, oh, oh excellent. Yeah. You knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. So I love that. Brett, and Brett looks at it. And you know, you, you cut, <laughs> it's a little green, like some lungs, legs, <laughs> legs, not. And yeah. Brett looked at me and I said, and I'm whispering to him because Star's oh, right in the what? kitchen. I'm like, you got to finish it, finish Better. it. And he's shaking his head like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> you should have slapped him across. No way, like his arms or something. So I'm like, like yes. Hot. So Star peeks his head out and goes, is there a problem with the soft shell crab? <laughs> and I'm looking at my plate's empty. And Brett's like, Nah, coach, it's fine. So I grab it real quick and eat it. Because <laughs> I don't want to start to get pissed off. <laughs> but Brett was shaking his head like, it doesn't matter what you say you're doing, you're not eating this crap. It's like me or you yeah. looking at escargot. Yeah. Yeah, like being a <laughs> friend. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm not thing. eating that. So I would go down periodically. I'd get some career advice from him. I, You know, I, I would be like so, you know, intricate with it. I'd be like... Okay, how many beers can I have each night? I mean, you know what I mean? I just wanted to learn and soak up everything I could from him. How long of a drive was it for you? Oh, it's nothing. It's an it's an hour and ten minutes. It's okay. nothing. That's and then the last time I saw him, my my sister was in the hospital, Hopkins dying of cancer, and I was, you know, I was down. Yeah. And uh I stopped off at the 7-Eleven in Havre de Grace, got him, got the star, a 12-pack of Miller. I just felt like I needed to see him. Yep. And uh, he was so nice to me, man. I told him all about that, and he asked. And uh, we sat there and had a conversation about that, and we talked about where I'm going with my life. And all. he was just... You should have you stayed the night and slept on his couch. What's that? You should have stayed the night and slept on his couch. No, no, but he doesn't go to bed till like four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you would have good. Yeah, but then I heard. Then I heard. You know, a couple years later, he passed on, or I don't even know if it was a couple years. Uh, uh, you know, he he lived to be seventy-seven. Was he seventy-seven? Okay. Yeah, I know that's not a bad run, right? I mean, that's I, that's older than I thought. And he lived hard. You know, he worked for Weeder. He told me a story about Arnold. Oh, yeah. Can yeah. I tell me? Uh, should we, nah, we might get sued. He's very well, litigious. Okay, well, let's, uh, an, an equipment manufacturer and magazine mobile. <laughs> yes. Allegedly. Yeah. But yeah, allegedly, yeah. Arnold was tired of not getting paid. This was like in 68 or something. Oh, and I know. he got in his Volkswagen and uh, went to the airport. And this magazine mogul... An equipment mogul <laughs> in there, gave him his money, and then it was ever after after that. Well, I think his uh, yeah. One of the th 
things that I really appreciated about Bill Starr is that he got results for his people. Oh, yeah. Uh, you guys, unfortunately, did not see the great George Hector. But this was a kid who was was from uh, what was Star's hometown? Harvard, Harvard. Harvard. Yeah. Harvard. yeah, yeah. And uh, Bill mentored this this young guy, George Hector. And George was a unique individual who eventually uh, the, the mythology the, the methodology and the mythology of the day was push your body weight upward and keep getting stronger and stronger so George was a 5 foot 10 individual with a fairly average frame I mean he wasn't he wasn't he didn't have the monster bone structure like Chalet or Kirk uh George pushed his body weight up to 365. Wow. Right? And he squatted 975, bench 600, dead, deadlifted 840, uh, won the IPF World Championship. Wow. All right. Then he reduced his body weight down to 242, deadlifted 870, squatted 880, raw benched 590. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Yeah, strong guy. He's strong and, and star trained him. And he worked in a hardware store the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's just, a, just a guy. He would do, George, I talked to George. He said, well, I said, you know, he said, I like to train alone. He said, I really don't like people. So I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I do things like, you know, uh, 740 for 10 or 745 for 10. I said, well, well, what happens if you miss? He said, I just throw it off my back. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. I said, didn't, uh, didn't, makes the best. didn't Star also coach guys like Patera and Kono and... No, 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 no. That was part of the York. The, that was the part York of the York. Thing. York yeah, he yeah. was... Uh, uh, Star was a Pan American champion at 220. Um, uh, again, I, I would say I think his most his most incredible athletic feat was cleaning 445 and standing erect with it. I think yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, at 220 body weight. Oh, come on. By the way, I mentioned I don't want to get off uh, track here, but we mentioned Ken Patera. Um, the uh, you've got a uh, article coming out next week called Chasing Ken Patera. <laughs> yeah. It's a great article, and it's a two-parter. It, I'm telling you, Marty, this is some of your greatest writing. I can't wait to release it. So look for that next week. Well, uh, you know, Ken was a uh, unique individual. Yeah. And All right, Jim. Jim, we do know some unique individuals, do yes. we not? Yeah, for sure. Well, this was interesting about Bill Starr. You know, I, I really hadn't uh, known really who Bill Starr was. You guys were friends with him, and this is all great firsthand information. He's the best. Yeah. He was, man. Any, any other cool little tidbits you want to add before we sign off? Uh, I appreciate it. Well, Marty, you're, the, you're the, the wise sage, so let me go, and then you can finish, but... He star. What star was was I think what he realized was he could give all his knowledge at the end. So his last years of his life, I think that he realized was that he could guys like me that were hunger for hungry for that knowledge. He had it and he wanted to give it. I mean, he felt like that was sort of his duty yeah, to exactly to sort of mentor us. You know, he was definitely a mentor of mine, and he, I was only around him ten times, but uh, he made a huge uh, impact on on what I. The way I coached and what I believed in, Jimmy. He he gave you a Vulcan mind meld. Yes, he did. <laughs> okay, and that's a good guy to get a Vulcan mind meld from, brother. I'm telling you, that guy. He had it together, and again, for me, uh, he was the uh, the athlete writer. Yeah. Right. And he showed you that that could be done. Yeah, and yeah. and you don't have to compromise in either end. Right, uh, and that's that's what you became. 
uh, to what I strove for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I became that. I yeah. Own, yeah. But again, he was the the prototype for that. No question. No. Boom. We were right. Well, good info. That was uh, that was very interesting. I learned a lot today. So uh, uh, I think we should we should plug his damn books, Jim. Uh, yeah, uh, what, what, what what his books? Uh, the lifting book. What was that? Uh, Wrong shall survive. No, uh, also Define Gravity. Oh, that was a good one. You can't find that. but it, uh, You can't, but that was the, the lifting prep book. That was excellent. The Strongest Shall Survive. Yep. Uh, and and any, of his, any of his articles on Milo? If so you if can, you go to Starting Strength and go to Resources, go to Articles, Bill Starr, there's probably 20 on there. Oh, there you go. Good. And uh, the tight slacks of Dezo Band. Yeah, yeah. Whoever yeah. that guy is, I like that guy. Oh, he's got your stuff on there for sure. I know. Do you know who he is? No, no, I don't know. I just I, enjoy reading it. He's like this weird mystery, mystery dude, like some Hungarian. I don't know. I don't know. Well, he's got your best article ever, in my opinion. Powerlifting needs a jihad. <laughs> well, well, that pissed no. everybody off. I know. To this day. Yeah. I get death. <laughs> I get death threats. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I refer him to Hendo. Yeah. The podcast in itself. <laughs> All right, boys. All right. All right. Let's close it down here. Um, let's see. First of all, check out Marty's weekly column and podcast, Raw with Marty Gallagher, at yeah. ironcompany.com. Uh, Marty is also available for online training and seminars. You can reach him by going to our athletes page at Iron Company. Uh, Jim Steele, we just launched his first article. It's up on the site called Embrace the Pain and Results <laughs> yes. Will Follow. Yes, indeed. So if you go to our articles, you'll see him there, and he's going to be writing for us here monthly. So we're excited about that. He's got some great info. Uh, Jim, anything else you want to plug real quick? Uh, Boss Barbell, B-A-S, barbell.com. I got the, that's my blog. With and I got some, I got two books. One's a training book. One's sort of a lifting autobiography book also okay cool uh uh, jim let's let's do another one of these with you jp on fred hatfield terry todd jeff beaverson uh you're gonna leave out the canadian dude poliquin oh poliquin too yeah right yeah I mean, this has been a bad year for, you know, uh, top flight trainers. Yep, that's right. Oh, I, yeah, I, you know, I respected all of those guys to differing degrees. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah, we could do something on that. All right. Very good. And finally, check out Iron Company for all, all your fitness equipment and gym flooring needs. And that's it, guys. Great show, and talk to you soon. All right, thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.